I have researched and studied, and finally I have figured out the secret to dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. You've probably seen or heard a commercial with a line somewhat similar. Somebody has found the secret to blank. It's a good marketing strategy. That sentence really draws you in. Because, one, we all naturally want to know secrets. Right? If somebody says, I have a secret, you're immediately like, what's the secret? Right? The second reason it's a good strategy is, depending on what they're talking about, you might be like, I really want to know the secret to that. Whatever first popped into your mind when I mentioned a commercial is probably one of those things. If you do a quick Google search, you'll find videos about everything from the secret to life, the secret to happiness, the secret to health and fitness, and even the secret to getting fluffy pancakes and crispy bacon. Everybody knows the secrets. Well, knowing a secret and describing what it's going to do for you, how it's going to change your life, naturally draws the ears of the listener. We want to know the secret. We want the benefits, the life-altering benefits of knowing the secret. Well, in our epistle reading today from Philippians chapter 4, Paul says these very words in verse 12. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance, and need. What's the secret? And what does knowing it do? How does it change my life? Well, if we look a little earlier in our text for the epistle today, Paul divulges this secret in verse 5. He says, the Lord is at hand. Or the, more simply put, the Lord is near. Now, at first, you might think, is that it? That's the big secret? I kind of knew that already. But, well, at first, this sounds like something you may hear Christian people say, the Lord is at hand, the Lord's near. I really want you to pause and consider what that means. One of the ways that we can do with this, especially with things we've heard over and over again as Christians, is to consider the reality in a different scenario. So I'll give you two scenarios. One is, you're on your way to an activity or an event. You've never been to it before. It's a new group you're joining. You know nobody there. How do you feel about going to this event? And I can tell you as somebody whose job and who kind of naturally doesn't mind meeting new people, you're still a little nervous and anxious. You don't know anybody. Everybody is an unknown. But now imagine that same scenario and your best friend is going with you. All of a sudden, it's not so scary. The fears and nerves, if they don't completely go away, they significantly lessen because someone I know is there nearby. Or the second scenario is moving. One my family knows quite well, or if you work in a profession where your job takes you to places, in mine... I could move somewhere in the matter of a couple of months. And it doesn't really matter whether or not I know anybody that lives anywhere near where I'm going. My first call as a pastor was to Ohio, and I didn't have any family or friends in Ohio. Didn't really have any family or friends in Pittsburgh either, nor did my wife. But now imagine that same scenario. You're moving to a new place, but you have some people there you know. Maybe it's a family member or a dear friend. And all of a sudden, the worries and the, the struggles of getting settled in a new place are a lot less because at least I know someone there. So considering these examples, hear Paul's words again. The Lord is at hand. The secret is the Lord is near. This means that the God of all things in his majesty, might, and his love is near to you. He's right there with you all the time. That is the secret. Now what difference does knowing this secret make? Well, Paul tells us that too. He says that when the Lord is near, one can be joyful, one can be gentle, and one can be content in any and all circumstances. 
I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty great to me. Because often I don't feel that way. I don't feel content or gentle or joyful. And there's a reason for that. It's a radically different way of thinking about life than what our world will tell you. After all, people who are gentle, they don't really get ahead in life. right? So you've got to be aggressive and ambitious and fight for what you want. And you certainly can't be content. You must always be wanting more. After all, if you're a good, any good consumer can't be content. How can I get you to buy something if you're content? The world also doesn't naturally make us joyful. It makes us feel anxious and uncertain. The data that's coming out now indicates a strong correlation between the lack and decline of religiosity in our country and the rise of anxiety and other mental health issues. Because think about it. Imagine the things that you consider to be important and remove faith in God. Uncertainty comes crashing in. Purpose flees. Meaning can't be found. So what does it really mean for us as Christians that we live in a world where the Lord is at hand? where our Lord is near to us. What might a life oriented around that reality look like? Paul gives us a glimpse. But can you imagine what our witness might look like to the world as a group of gentle, joyful, and content people? I don't know about you, but I, from what I see, those are things people want. They want to be joyful. They want to be happy. They want meaning in their lives. They want to be content. They want to be at peace with their situations. And yet, it seems so fleeting. This is why it's so shocking to the world when somebody who has everything the world says will give you all these things says that their life is empty. That they feel like they're missing something. The one that comes to mind to me because he was a a favorite actor of mine is when Robin Williams committed suicide. Well-loved, hilarious, wealthy, but not joyful, not content. I think it's definitely worth reflecting on this reality in our own lives and finding out In contrast, what is making you anxious? What is making you unsatisfied? What is making you discontent? Because Paul tells us here that as people who know the secret, we don't have to live life that way. The secret that the Lord is near. Now why does that secret help us so much? Well, I think it solves two of the greatest existential worries that every human wrestles with in their life. Knowing that the Lord is near clears these out for you. The two big worries that every person has, whether they have the Christian language for it or not, is worry over the bad things they've done, particularly a worry that other people will know that about them and thus reject them. And the second is, What happens when they die? A worry about the future. And really wrapped into that worry about the future is a question of purpose. Why am I here? Where am I going? What does this all mean? And if you think about it for a moment, you can see not only that we but the world spend a lot of time and energy and a good chunk of our lives avoiding these questions and realities. I need to make sure everyone knows the things I think or do. I I need to make sure no one knows the things that I think or do that are bad. If they find out, they'll reject me. So thus, I'm going to avoid intimacy and real connection. I'm going to throw myself into distractions and hobbies in order to avoid exposure. Because then I can sort of live my life thinking, I'm a pretty decent person. 
And pretty decent people don't really need Jesus. Sinners need Jesus. Or the amount of effort and time and money put into pretending that I'm not getting old. I become obsessive about my fitness and my physical health because I feel like I'm slipping away. That the vigor of my youth, the attractiveness of my features, well, I'm not quite the same person I see in the mirror anymore. I'm getting wrinkles. I need to do everything to cover this up. I need to avoid the reality of death. If the Lord is near, you don't need to worry about these things. If the Lord is near, you find out the truth about what happens to sinners in the presence of God. Their sin is known and is washed away, forgiven in the unbelievably abundant tidal wave of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is near. This is what Paul is expressing. Now, you may not know, because it's not in the text, but the context of, Jesus, or of Paul writing this letter to the Philippians is he is in prison in Rome, awaiting a verdict that will determine whether he lives or dies when he writes these words. I don't know about you, I would have a hard time being content in such a situation fighting to prove my innocence, because he was indeed innocent, the reason that he's there. And he says, everyone knows the reason I'm here is because I preached Christ crucified. How can he be joyful, gentle, and content in such a situation? He doesn't need to worry about what people think of him, for he's been told in Christ he is a new creation. All of his sins washed away. And he's been given a perfect righteousness, which is not his own, but one that belongs to Jesus. Earlier in the letter, he expresses this when he says, For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Clearly, he's not worried about his future when it comes to death. He knows where he's going. He's been promised by the Lord who is near. Because the Lord is near, he knows his sin is washed away. Because the Lord is near, he knows he has an eternal life that has overcome death. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord is near to you. He is near right now in his word and in his sacraments. He has promised to meet you here as he's invited you to the wedding feast. A feast which we gather around and receive as a foretaste of the feast of the joy that is to come in its fullness when he returns. But he's also with you wherever you go. This is the promise that he tells his disciples, the final words he gives to them as his, their incarnate Savior before he ascends to heaven, he says to them, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, as we were reading the Philippians 4 text, you were probably thinking, man, there's a lot of great lines in there. Ones you've heard a bunch. Ones that maybe you've turned to in times of struggle and uncertainty. And you would be right. It's one of the reasons I decided to preach on this text because right now there's a lot of death, there's a lot of destruction. Our world isn't offering us much hope. And the truth is, it never has. But as Christians, we know the secret. The secret to being joyful and gentle and content, even in the midst of tragic, sad, and difficult circumstances just like Paul is in our text today. But each of those great verses is undergirded by this truth that the Lord is near. So when you read those again or when you meditate on those in your mind, put that truth in front 
of each sentence. Dear friends in Christ, because the Lord is at hand, you can rejoice always. Because the Lord is at hand, you don't need to be anxious about anything. Because the Lord is at hand, you can talk to him, pray to him with thanksgiving, and make every one of your needs known to him, for he is near you. Because the Lord is at hand, think about what is good, just, and true. Because the Lord is at hand, you can be content in all your circumstances. Abundant circumstances and those of need. Circumstances of humiliation and those of honor. Because the Lord is at hand. And I'll close today with the familiar words you've heard me say most weeks as your pastor. This is where they come from, Philippians chapter 4. And Paul speaks them with an authority that assumes the reality of the nearness of God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus because he is near. In the name of Jesus, amen.